Classes in Wargame Design, a series of lectures based on George Philly's book, Designing Board Wargames, Introduction, to be available from Smashwords.com and Amazon Kindle. And today, Lecture 16, Panzer Blitz, Part 2. So today I'm going to continue my discussion of Panzer Blitz. Panzer Blitz is a much more tactical game than Stalingrad or 1914. You can actually see things that are identifiable as people and vehicles move. You can identify weapons, weapons that are ranged weapons that attack a distance away. You can actually, in a certain sense, see game tactics. It, it's not the finest level of tactics in the sense that you could have a game where each unit counter represents one person. And that is, actually that's not the finest level of tactics either. There is a board game due to Tom Wham, Snit's Revenge, which is played inside the body of the one side, and it is the competition between the creatures on the other side, which are much smaller, and the immune system of the defender. It is hard to get much smaller than this, but in fact, that is the bottom end of the scale. At the top end, well, your units can represent all sorts of things, and if you go to space warfare, the number of ships involved can be very large indeed. Uh, there are, of course, space warfare games that choke if you try to represent three spaceships. There are also space warfare games, for example, if you're simulating uh, the E.E. E. Smith Lensman series, two battles in Two, two galaxies in conflict, there is the wonderful line, you know, we have 10 million star, star fleets, we can't really spend too much time on any one of them. And if you do the numbers that Smith supplies, you would sort of guess, gee, they may have like a quadrillion combatant warships between them. Uh, they look, one side loses badly. The bad guys. Okay. So we were discussing um, combat. Uh, however, Panzer Blitz has units. And the units may be distinguished by the fact that some of them have NATO unit symbols and some of them have prettily drawn pictures of military vehicles. And this is to draw a distinction between things that are nominally infantry units of all sorts, and there are a whole bunch of them, and things that function as infantry-like, like, like um, light anti-aircraft guns, and on the other hand, vehicles. Panzer Blitz, because it has all, we are at the very tactical scale, there are all sorts of different pieces of equipment moving around the battlefield. Uh, machine guns of different sizes, all sorts of models of tanks, trucks, wagons, you name it. And the net result is that Panzer Blitz introduces the notion of the unit class. And the point of the unit class is that you're going to write a rule, and the same rule refers to regular infantry, guards, infantry, engineers, cavalry, uh, you can go down the list and there may be a whole pile of units that are all the same. Or if you are writing a unit, a rule that deals with fight, shooting at objects with armor, uh, there are dozens of different armored vehicles and it's useful to write the rule in a way that allows you to re refer collectively to them. And so there are a set of identifiers, the identifier label goes here. And the identifiable labels are infantry, armor, mortars, heavy artillery firing explosive shells. You notice I'm going down, a, it's a list, and the new list is much shorter than the old list. Carriers, All carriers are not the same. Some carriers are CI and can only carry infantry. Others can be used to move heavy equipment. Uh, to make life more interesting, 
So we have these um, counters, and they have numbers on them. And one of them is the familiar attack factor. And another is the defense factor. And another is the movement factor. However, since these are ranged weapons, some of them, there is also a number here, which is the range, which is how far away a unit can be from another unit and still attack it. And if you're doing tactical scale rules, this is a significant issue. Um, I, now, that's not the only issue. I mean, if we have a modern issue military rifle, it has an effective range of at least 300 yards, and some of them will not, at least nominally go out to 400 or 500. However, if we stand and look out the window and try to ask what the useful range of the weapon is, you discover that before you look very far, even though we're on the second floor, before you look very far in any direction, you can't see any further because there's stuff in the way. And that is the line of sight limitation. Namely, there has to be a line of sight so you can see and a line of fire so you can shoot between you and the target. Uh, if you wander around under many conditions uh, saying, oh, we could have a rifle with a line of fire, with a range of a thousand yards, a kilometer, under many conditions is totally worthless because you can't see a kilometer away. There's stuff in the way in all directions. And if it's just a rifle and you try to look a kilometer away, seeing someone who's, a thousand, who's three and a half thousand feet away, uh, they're too small to see and you now need telescopic sights and all this other neat stuff. So in the end, there is a range limitation, and in addition to the range limitation, there are also the line of sight rules, which we're going to discuss. So far, so good? Okay, so what I am saying in essence is, uh, when the designers did Panzer Blitz, when Jim Dunnigan first created Tactical Game 3, and then move over, moved over to recreate it as Panzer Blitz. He had to be substantially creative relative to simply taking the Stalingrad and Waterloo and D-Day rules, which are all very similar to each other, and repurposing them a trifle to create a new game. Now, in principle, he could have done that. However, um, um, he could have simply copied the rules, but it would have totally missed the point of introducing something very new and very different. And as it turned out, very successful, because the family of games in question, which goes on uh, Panzer Leader, um, Arab-Israeli Wars, Advanced Squad Leader, you get a series of games with rules that are much more like Panzer Blitz that turned out to be very popular. Oh, types of units. I kind of dropped one. There's also a blank, which is a command post. The command post shows up under certain conditions. Okay, so we have different types of units, and we may now consider how they engage each other. And last time I discussed the general question of problems that you have to solve that create a tactical representation that looks like a tactical representation. I mean, if you're doing even a medieval game, you could say, well, it's still like Stalingrad, but this sort of overlooks the deep issue that some sides had archers or artillery, cannon of the period weren't very good necessarily, or whatever, trebuchets. Uh, onagers, all sorts of mechanical weapons for throwing sharp things over large distances. And if you say everything just has a range of one square, you're sort of overlooking the features that are actually significant. Um, okay, so what's, having said we have units and issues, there are then a bunch of things we have to treat to get around those issues and get where we're going. Uh, one of the issues is line of sight. And the general notion of line of sight is that you can't see through things unless you're Superman. 
uh, and therefore you've got these restrictions on what it is possible to do. Uh, so we have terrain, I've discussed terrain already to some extent, and you have gullies, you have flat terrain, and you have slopes, and you have hilltops, some of which go on for a considerable distance. And having said, we have this, these different types of terrain. On the flat ground and the hilltops, people don't build on slopes that much. You can also have forests, and you can have there's an onion dome on the church. You can have buildings, and because you have all of these objects of different sorts, um, you have blocks to line of sight. Now, the first part of saying you have blocks to line of sight, um, you all have to have symbols for it, and what is done, well, here is a town. And there are little building symbols that fill in parts of the hex and very carefully do not creep over the border into the next square, so there's no doubt which squares are town squares. And then some of the hex edges are labeled. And if this were woods, you would see in some cases the same fill in. And if you have a series of squares that are sort of dark tan indicating their slope, you will occasionally, but not always, have a line like that, which indicates that in the slope there's some sort of a turn roll in the ground that blocks how far you can see. So having said this, what do you now do? Well, the first statement is that if two units are next to each other, they can always see each other. If two units are further away, you have to ask what is on the intervening terrain. And if there is stuff on the intervening terrain, you've got a problem. In discussing this, there's a distinction made between what are called low, that's these, medium, that's slopes, these lines separating slope squares, and high, those are hilltop squares. The area over which the map was set up is very flat. So you might say that if you were going to transport this to remote Switzerland, you would need a bunch of rules dealing for squares where the mountains do this, and you have an alp and the alt goes up, 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 up for a very long distance indeed relative to the flat terrain. Um, it is always interesting that on the occasion I flew over Switzerland, the pilot blandly mentioned we were at 20,000 feet, and you could see river valleys and streams usually filled, um, lined below, and then the tops of the alp were close enough to the airplane that you could see them moving relative to ground due to the perspective rules, even though you were at a considerable altitude. You don't usually have this issue with airliners flying over Massachusetts, not unless they're really, really low. Well, when there used to be air service from Boston to Worcester, as there was at one time, they did take in the wheels between takeoff and landing, um, but that would be very low indeed. In any event, we have this series of different obstacles, and there are then rules as to what you can see across. And the first notion is that if the unit is directly behind the obstacle, and the person trying to see them is over here, they can't. And if the unit is in a town or a woods, the line of sight into the town or woods is blocked. Now, the game evolution, further games in the series, had the notion that if you have people shooting out of a town, you can spot the muzzle flashes after a bit. 
And once they've started do doing unpleasant things in your direction, you know where they are. That, that rule was developed after this game was created. So you now have the statement that if there's, there are things in the way, there are issues. So what counts as things in the way? Well, you remember I mentioned there are hilltops here, which are divided. We're looking at the side into hexagons. And if you have to look across two hilltop edges, you're looking across the more or less flat top of the hill, and anything hiding down here cannot be seen. Of course, there's an exception, or it's not exactly an exception. If there's another hilltop over here, if you're trying to sight from top of the hill to top of the hill, it works just fine, except for the possibility that there are woods or towns with blocking edges in the way. So what the designer has done is to say, we are going to have rules that sort of reflect three-dimensional play. Uh, you can get much more elaborate rules. At the extreme end, you will say, we will have three-dimensional terrain, and we will have little periscopes which sit on the table, and the um, gamer looks in through the little periscope to see what is visible. That was done in Battle of Kalnock. Um, that's a sort of an elaboration away from standard board game design. Um, so what we do is we say we have these divisions, and but we have some additional rules because there are all those different types of height of terrain, and if you're writing the rules, eventually you have to put down all of the possible combinations of start position, finish position, and things in the way. And so, for example, if we have people hiding at the base of a gully, these are like the gullies in Texas. They're reasonably wide, they're reasonably flat, there is a water course which in the Ukraine actually has water in it as opposed to Texas where it's quite dry. But if you're a modest distance away, you can't look down into it, except in the Ukraine there are slopes and hills and if you're on a slope or a hill, you do have a line of sight to someone in the gully. If you're on flat ground near the gully, you may, inf may or may not know the people are there, but you don't have a line of sight because there's this drop-off that protects them. In terms of a medieval warfare game, these drop-offs would include whatever uh, fortifications or other structures have been installed. Now, an interesting question that arises is as follows. Here is a piece of flat terrain. Here is someone on a hilltop, at the edge of the hilltop, so they can possibly see. And in between is a medium type obstacle, meaning a slope. And the question is, does the slope block line of sight? And what the, what the designer had to say is, well, it depends where it is, doesn't it? If it's here, it's clearly blocking. If it's here, you're peeking over the top. Now, you could do something very refined where you have altitudes and position locations for these features, and you then use a nomogram to dis determine uh, whether things are blocked or not. Nomograms are a bad idea in competitive games. It's sort of like the old spinners you may remember on childhood games. You have the flat cardboard and the pie wedge and the metal arrow that will run in circles. You whack the metal arrow and it's supposed to come up in one position or another. The problem is with annoying frequency, the arrow will come to a stop more or less on the dividing line. And there is then this unpleasant disagreement as to whether it's on one side or the other side. Uh, the game of life, this goes back slightly more than 50 years, found a clever solution to this, namely, yes, it rotates, and there are spines sticking up, and there is something flexible, and it is always unmistakable, if you're lucky and the friction isn't too large, it will even um, straighten out. It is always unambiguous where the um, pointer is pointing. There's some weird television show I sometimes see when I am a fortune. Thank you. Which has the same feature. Um, in any event, 
you don't want to use nomograms if you can help it, because it's just an invitation to disharmony. However, what you can do is to say, I am on a hexagon here. I, the other character is on a hexagon here. And I will draw a line of sight from center to center, which I can always do. And I will count how many hex edges I cross before I get to the obstacle. And this works fine even if the line of sight is kind of like this, and therefore, instead of cross going straight through the center of hex edges, you're going like that. It still works. And you can count hex edges. And the count, one, two, three, four, is unambiguous except, does anyone see where there's still an ambiguity? Well, suppose I'm going off diagonally. And it's suppose, remember, these diagonals can be quite long. The, the longest range is, if I recall, 610 or 16. At some point, there is a hex edge here. And you go from the center of the square exactly into the intersection. And over here, exactly to the center of the square. And if you can do a little plain geometry, it is entirely clear that you have exactly intersected one end of something that block, would block line of sight. And the way you deal with this in writing game rules is that you actually have a specific rule to deal with this case. If you simply say, well, um, it's obvious, it, all players will agree it's obvious, it's just they will all agree it's obvious that their, the interpretation of the rule that is momentarily favorable to them is correct. So you act, there's actually a specific rule as to whether these block or do not block. And that is this, this is the sort of, if you are writing um, a game, you have to recognize the special cases. This, of course, is identical with the issue that comes up in computer game design, where the poor computer is told to do something, and occasionally the poor computer has problems. Um, nonetheless, the answer is that if the obstacle is closer to the high side than the low side, it does not block line of sight. If it is closer to the low side than the high side, it does block line of sight. Um, you also have to take into account the possibility that there are multiple things going on at the same time. Uh, so, for example, I said uh, hilltop to hilltop, the intervening stuff does not block because it's below it. You're shooting over the trees at the next hill. The exception to that, though, yeah, you're shooting at the next hill, but there's a forest here. And then you have to discuss the specific case of woods on top of hilltops and what it does or does not obstruct. And eventually, if you keep doing this, you have identified all of the cases. And if you're careful, you try to write simple rules that cover a whole bunch of different cases as opposed to big square matrix with all possible outcomes labeled one at a time, where the players have to identify the outcomes, and you have to write the outcomes out. Big matrices tend to be need a great deal of care and attention, or there will be negative outcomes, because you will forget something when you're labeling a square, or you will mislabel a square, or you will label squares and you will have forgotten the rule, the general rule, the line of sight always works in both directions. If you can see them, they can see you. Now, they may or may not have spotted you. We'll get to spotting in a second. But if you can see them, they can see you. And therefore, um, the, this, that matrix is supposed to be symmetric if it's set up in a reasonable manner. Okay, so this is the general idea on line of sight. The point of line of sight rules is that you have to ask, given that you only have a two-dimensional map, which you have been able to label in various ways, you have to ask, well, can the two sides actually see each other at a distance? Of course, having said that, 
There is also the question of, well, could you see them even though they're fairly close and nothing is in the way? For example, if we were to look out some of the windows here across the pond, there's a woods. And if we have people right in the woods close to the edge and they're not moving and they're wearing camouflage rather than bright orange, they might be fairly hard to see. And so we have an additional rule called spotting. And the notion of the spotting rule is that if you have people in a woods or a town and you want to be able to see them to shoot at them, you have to have one of your units right next to them to point them out. The Panzerblitz rules were the first iteration of developing spotting rules. Uh, the difficulty with the Panzerblitz spotting rule comes into the turn sequence, namely first units fire and then units move. So if I have a unit hiding in a town here, and you want to spot me, uh, you have to get one of your units to move up next to the town during the movement phase. Then they have to sit there during my entire turn. And then, if they're still there and alive at the start of the next turn, we can go to the fire phase. Uh, of course, I will notice your unit sitting next to me. And it may be that all of my friends out here will politely cooperate by shooting at your unit so that when it is the t you have reached your fire phase, your unit is no longer there, or is at least no longer alive, or has been dispersed, and as a result, I'm not spotted. Um, Panzer Blitz, the later games in the series made ver tried various alternative approaches to dealing with this issue. Uh, for example, saying that um, if a unit moved from a town here to a town there, or vice versa, say my unit had done this during the turn, if my unit moved like that and was in the open, because it had been in the open, it was spotted, and it was, when it was seen marching into the town, it stayed spotted. At least I knew roughly where it was hiding. Um, another alternative is to say that if a unit fires, it becomes spotted, and it stays spotted. Um, that's also not a Panzer Blitz rule. I am sort of showing there are multiple ways of handling the same problem, and you actually have to pay some attention to them to get things to work. So far, so good. Questions? Okay, so we have discussed spotting, and we have discussed terrain. Um, and now we should probably move ahead to what happens as a turn sequence. That is, you actually have a game, there are things happening, and the things must happen in a certain order. And the most important issue is that first you have most but not all combat, and then you have movement. Notice this is exactly the reverse of the um, scheme in Stalingrad where you move and then attack. Now, this turn order has some interesting features. If you um, have a game like Stalingrad, uh, if you said, first we roll all the attacks and then we do the movement, hmm. So here I have a delaying unit. And you roll up with everything you can mass here. But it, if we change the turn order around, it's first combat, then movement. So combat is over. I have moved up to here. On my turn, I take my unit and move it one square to the rear. You're no longer next to me. You can't shoot at me. And so my unit acts as a, an indestructible delaying unit. You can keep moving next to it, and it has to back up. But you can't actually fight it. Uh, that isn't very good. That, that 
turn order plus the Stalingrad rules are not going to work. I have seen it used. There is at least one game on Rourke's Drift which had this feature. The designer was warned, I have been told by playtesters, there is this technical problem, namely the British can just back up one square per turn and um, the other side, which has to be adjacent in order to fight them, can't do anything. Well, sometimes people don't listen to playtesters and sometimes they felt that it doesn't matter because that is not a tactic that the British player would ever use. Yes? Would this uh, rule, uh, rule system work if the units were ranged? Oh, it works just fine if the units... It, because it, this is the rule system used in Panzer Blitz and it works just fine. Because after all... Here are the units whose turn it is. We get to the com first to the combat section of the turn, and off here is an enemy unit on which we have line of sight and spotting, and therefore we can shoot at it immediately. And so the move and then the um, attack and then move sequence works fine if there are ranged units. Well, that's good, but uh, what if we have infantry? You know, the Panzer Blitz squares are about 250 yards across which is sort of the effective range of many infantry weapons. If it's hand grenades, it's, less, it's more than the effective range. How are we going to handle um, infantry? And the answer is, I said that most combat occurs here. Ranged combat occurs here. But there are two other sorts of combat in Panzer Blitz. And one is called the overrun, and the other is called close assault. The overrun occurs during movement. We have several people with pistols standing in the road and coming at them as a column of enemy tanks. And the enemy tanks sort of move all around them and over them during the movement phase and they don't stop. Some of the tanks have to conduct an attack to deal with the idiots with pistols, but that's during movement. The second piece is close assault. And the notion in close assault here is an infantry unit. It has a movement factor of one. Here is an enemy unit. So the infantry unit moves its movement range, which is one or three if it's cavalry, and it is now next to the enemy unit. And even though it has a range of one, it can conduct a close assault against this space. And close assault, the close assault is an add-on. It's not the same as ranged combat. It is the sort of thing that happens if you have a group of people with spears or pikes running at you, and they have to run a distance, but after they've run a distance, they are right next to you, and now they can close, and you can see who's sharp things are mounted on longer sticks. Um, so that's close assault. Okay, so we're going to have movement rules and we're going to have combat rules and the fire occurs first and after all this there is basically a restoration phase in which various temporary things that happen are undone. So what happens during the sequence? Well, the first thing that happens, combat, is that ranged units all shoot at each other. Or to be precise, all of the ranged units on one side get to fire at the units at the other side that they're able to, and perhaps inflict casualties. There's never any danger of a unit conducting ranged fire taking casualties itself. It gets casualties itself because during the enemy's turn, the enemy has a combat phase, a firing phase, and can shoot at your units. Um, we are way back in time to 1971 or so, and so while we've inverted the order of fire and movement relative to tra traditional games, if you look at it, you realize that... Um, 
it's still one side does everything and then the other side does everything. Now you might say, gee, combat is really more simultaneous than that. Shouldn't there be rules to reflect that? And in point of fact, when we get to some of the more elaborate rule sets for something like Omaha Beach, we will discuss rule sets which create the sort of simultaneity we're talking about, or come close to it. It's never perfect, but then realistically speaking, combat isn't exactly simultaneous. That is, if we have groups of people walking through woods towards each other, some of them really do spot the enemy before the others do, and they get the first shot off. Okay, so we're going to have combat first. And since this is ranged fire, you basically get to choose who you're going to shoot at. And since you get to choose who you're shoot, going to shoot at or not, combat is always voluntary. There are no zones of control. You're never required to attack, but you're allowed to attack. And therefore, you sort of choose your targets. Now, having said you choose your targets, the first issue is that the defender may be in a stack. There's a stacking rule. The stacking rule in Panzer Blitz is not the same as it is in some other games. German units are allowed to stack three high. Russian units are only allowed to stack two high. Um, so here I am, and I am going to shoot at a stack. And the question is, what am I allowed to do? And the rules give me three choices, one of which is to shoot at the weakest unit first. The second is to shoot at the entire stack as a single object. And that can get somewhat messy because here is the stack I'm shooting at. It's a single object. It has a humongous total defense factor, and I am unlikely to be able to damage it. But I could pick off its units starting with the weakest. The third choice, however, is to start with the weakest unit and attack it at one to one, and then hit the weaker unit at one to one, and then to hit the strongest unit in the stack, I'm assuming it's a three unit German stack, if it's a two unit Russian stack, we're done, at whatever odds I want. And so I am allowed to shoot at stacks, but I have to start, at least start with shooting at the weakest unit. Does anyone see a loophole here? or a rules feature. That there are two units of the same strength. Well, then you're allowed to shoot at either of them. Oh, okay. But that is a legitimate question, because some player will argue that since neither of the units is weaker, you aren't allowed to shoot at one and then the other. You have to shoot at them as a stack. And if you're careful, you write a rule to deal with this. Uh, however, there is another issue, namely, There are a certain number of tank units that are really big and mean, and there are a certain number of vehicle units that are in fact wagons. And if I wish to make life difficult for you, I stack this thing on top of the tank and you can't shoot at it unless you engage the wagon first. Um, in some later games in the series, if you were dropping artillery onto a square, and there were several units in the square, the rule was the artillery fire divided evenly among all three units. In which case, these things on top of that suddenly provided magic armor. The reasonable rule was, of course, you drop artillery onto the square. The artillery can't tell what's there if it's remote fire. Instead, the entire force of the number of attack factors of the artillery hit each unit in the square separately. And that's the way the rule should have been done. Okay, so we have a rule for shooting at stacks. <coughs> 
and the road shooting of its stacks. Yeah, there are several ways it could have been done, but this was one of them. We now have an issue which is you have lots of various different types of weapons, and the different types of weapons do not all affect or have some chance of affecting the enemy the same way. Because you have people who are like us if we are standing in the open. Uh, there was a set that we are in a period where there's essentially no body armor other than the helmet. And we have vehicles that you have to hit fairly hard to damage. And then we have things that are coated with layers of armor plate. And we also have weapons ranging from pistols to fairly heavy artillery <coughs> firing explosive shells to what are called armor-piercing shells that are specifically designed to make holes in thick steel plates and do unpleasant things to whatever is on the other side. And so what has to be done to some extent is to write rules that will handle this. And it appears to me we are approximately out of time. Yes? And therefore we will get to how different types of weapons affect each other when we get to the next lecture. Until then, we are done.